Um, okay, the, the uh, I mean, when Sean initially uh, suggested to me that I speak at this symposium, it was the spring of uh, 2020, and I was in Dublin, um, and that was just before our, our lives were all turned upside down. Uh, and there are, as we all know, many disadvantages and many unpleasant impacts of, um, of COVID, not of the pandemic, but the, the switch to virtual communication uh, does mean that I can be with you virtually today, uh, even though I am in North Carolina, I'm not in Wicklow, despite the, the background picture. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about the, the Osman invasion of Dublin. Um, the, the picture you're looking at is John Speed's famous 1610 map of Dublin, showing the suburb of Oxman Town or Ostman Town on the north side of the Liffey, uh, including St. Nickens Church um, uh, over here and St. St. Mary's Abbey over here. Um, today, as Oxman Town, it is home to some, some cafes and what looks like some very, very expensive skincare products. The usual story about the origins of Oxman Town or Ostman Town has to do with the Ostmen. So again, the usual study is that our usual story is that the Ostmen uh, were the inhabitants of Dublin uh, and Ireland's other uh, coastal, Hiberno-Scandinavian coastal towns, and that at the arrival of the English at the end of the 12th century, they were expelled from Dublin across the river and established this, this new suburb of Ostman Town. Um, this story, Wikipedia, of course, is great for getting kind of the, the closest thing to a consensus picture, but uh, this account has been criticised and has been undermined seriously by Emer Purcell's work, and we'll come back to that later on. Um, what I want to discuss is a, a different version of this story, a different account of the foundations of the uh, of. Osman Town that survives in a work from John Speed's time. So we're going to start in the, the 16th and 17th centuries and work our way backwards. We we'll start with Meredith Hammer. Uh, Hammer was a Welsh clergyman who arrived in, uh, in Dublin, in Ireland, in 1591. Some years later, he was appointed Vicar Coral of Christchurch Cathedral and subsequently to the Prebend of St. Michael's or St. Michael's Church. In the north of the city um, and it's there he was subsequently buried in 1604 so having held that office for 10 years. Hammer wrote a, a chronicle of Ireland the history um, yeah sorry a, a chronicle of Ireland that was published by James Ware in 1633 alongside two others so Campion's Irish history and Spencer's view of the present state of Ireland. The Chronicle has a, a, a pretty good reputation among those who know Hammer and his period better than I do. So one commentator has said that it is the most historical of these three, of these three texts. Hammer was a great collector of sources related to Ireland's medieval history. And reading his account, one thing that really stands out is uh, his willingness to, to talk about Ireland in international context. Um, he makes significant use, for example, of um, Camden's edition of the Chronicle of the Kings of Man and the Isles and looking for references to Dublin in there really helps demonstrate that, that Dublin was part of this broader cultural zone, something, this is kind of a perspective that went out of fashion for a long time um, before being revived by, by Sean Duffy and others. Uh, in the midst of, this gen of his generally well-informed account of the history of Ireland in the 11th and 12th centuries, Hammer writes that Stannyhurst findeth, anno 1095, that there came certain Esterlings to the north side of Dublin adjoining the Lippy, and seated themselves there, so that of them to this day the place is called Ostman Town, roughly Oxmanton. In the parish, St. Michael's uh, of one Michanus, or St. Michael's after Michanus, a Dane and a bishop which founded the church, unto whom Murrachud, or Murrah, king of Leinster, gave that parcel of land to use. Uh, now it's not on the screen, but he continues by saying that the fair or green, the fair green or commune, now called Ostman Town Green, was all wood. He diggeth at this day to any he who diggeth at this day to any depth shall find the ground full of roots. From thence, anno 1098, King William Rufus, by the license of King Murrachud, uh, had that frame which made up the roof of Westminster Hall. 
where no English spider webber or breed up to this day. Um, nice, little, nice little addendum there. Um, there are clearly some inaccuracies in this story. Um, for example, Hammer's Murrah or Murrah, King of Leinster, must have been, if he was an Irish king, Murkata Ibrian, um, King of Munster and claimant to the kingship of Ireland. Um, Murkartok ruled Dublin between 1075 and 1086 under his father, and again for, for maybe perhaps two decades after uh, his reconquest of the city in 1094. There's also much here that is unattested elsewhere, in, uh, including the story that Murkartok was being donated land to St. St. Michael's Church. But both that aspect of the account and Hanner's report that wood from Oxmantown, uh, Osmondstown, was exported for the construction of Westminster Hall have been given credence by modern scholars. No less an authority than Howard Clark accepted that the story of Green's donation was at least plausible. Um, and the archeologist and architecture historian, Richard Jem, points out regarding the, the shipping of wood to Westminster that it would have been a pointless detail for Hammer to have invented, and he probably saw a relevant document, perhaps in his office as prebendary of St. Michael's from 1595 to 1604. And this idea that Hammer had access to documents, to records that are now lost, and hangs behind his account, right, and, and gives some of this, um, some of his, his uh, claims, which are unattested otherwise a certain authority. Um, and that's worth keeping in mind today. So attention has been paid to the story of the founding of the church and to the story of the export of wood. Less attention has been paid to the opening part of this statement, namely the, the record of the arrival of Esterlings or Ostmen um, and their settlement of Dublin during this period. Um, so this is very different to the, the general account. Hammer claims that the Osman arrived in 1095 and took up residence, at which point they were given, uh, at which point their church was given land by an Irish king. And what I want to do today is, is to, to see whether there's any basis to this alternative account. So I'm not looking to see if there was a Viking invasion, obviously it was, it's specifically this event in 1095 um, that I'm interested in, this Ostman arrival. There are, I suppose, two questions I want to answer. The first is whether there was an invasion of Dublin at the end of the 11th century, one distinct from, from the early uh, invasion, conquest, and settlement by Vikings. The second question, uh, if there was an invasion, who were the invaders, and what does this tell us about the identity of the Ostman? So going back to what Sean said earlier on, like my the interest in uh, identity. Now, a third and related question would be whether Osmantown was truly established in the 1090s, but that will have to, um, to wait for another day. So let's, let's start looking at where Hammer potentially got his, his sources. He tells us that one source of his was Richard Stannyhurst. Um, Stan, the working question is Stannyhurst's contribution to Raphael Hollandshed's Chronicles of Ireland. And um, this is not the most confidence inspiring of accounts. Um, as you can see here, Stannyhurst provides uh, an account of the Battle of Clontarf, which he dates to the year 1050, um, which I don't know, maybe that means we get to commemorate it all over again in a couple of decades, which would be nice. Um, but after that, so having, having discussed the death of Brian Baru at, at Clontarf and dating it to 1050, he says there arrived a fresh supply of Easterlings in Dublin in the year 1095, and they settled themselves on the other side of the city, which of them to this day is called Ostmantown. Now, there's no mention here of St. Michael's Church or of Murkrat of Ubrian, so this can't, be, um, this can't have been Hammer's only source. But it is, it is, I think, securely his source for, for the arrival of Ostmen in 1095. As a, interestingly, and I think this is worth mentioning, Stannyhurst contradicts this point in his other, his longer and more famous work, 
his great deeds in Ireland, the, the Rables in Hibernia, Gestis, where he dates the, the most recent arrival of the Ostmen uh, and their settlement, their creation of Ostman Town uh, to the year 1050, without any mention of subsequent events in 1095. Earlier in this work, Stanley Hurst actually relates another account of the arrival of the Osmen that I want, to, I want to pursue for a moment. So this is separate from his reference to the, the foundation of Osmontown. In referring to Waterford, he says that in ancient time, this city was called Menapia, as Dublin was called Edlana. It, meaning Dublin, might more correctly be called Amalana after Olaf or Amalanus, who founded the city. Citric is also reported to have founded Waterford and Ivor Limerick. These were full brothers called Ostmen by our writers who formerly obtained great rank in Ireland. So here he records uh, the, the origins of Dublin, Waterford and Limerick by three brothers and Ostmen. Hanmer likewise provides this. So, um, so in talking about the, the Dublin, this is earlier in his account, he talks about Dublin falling under Amalanus, Waterford under Citric and Limerick under Ivor. Um, and they built these and other cities, this nation, which is called the Esterling nation or Estmen, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I bring this up because in this instance, the source upon which um, Hammer and Stanley Hurst were drawing is very easily identifiable. Um, they both owed the debt, as did, as did much historical writing of the period about Ireland, to the 12th century clerical author, Gerald of Wales, chronicler of the English invasion of Ireland. Um, now, Gerald, of course, is well known, I'm sure, to all of you. He wasn't very kind to the Irish in his works, and I think, um, I think that feeling is reciprocated by many later historians, or especially in the mo early modern period. In his uh, Topographia Hibernia, the, the history and topography, uh, topography, of, topography of Ireland, Gerald provides an account of the history of Ireland from the arrival of its earliest inhabitants to its own time. Now, this is not um, discussed very much by Irish historians, in part because it is, um, it, it's very inaccurate. Um, but although it's inaccurate, it's very interesting, in, in, especially in terms of the sources Gerald uses and the way he construct, uh, constructs his narrative out of them, especially Irish sources. And so he makes much use of the Irish origin legend, the Leather Gavala Aaron. Uh, of interest to us is the fact that Gerald provides a long uh, narrative, a long and reasonably detailed narrative of the Viking Age in Ireland. And these are just some of the highlights. Uh, interestingly, Gerald divides the Viking Age into two parts. The first characterized by invasion and plunder, and the second by settlement by economic integration. Uh, and in, in this regard, he actually provides a model for much modern writing on the subject, which tends to talk about Viking attacks and then Hiberno-Scandinavian settlement. Gerald begins by reporting that Norwegians put in at Irish shores with a great fleet. They, took, uh, they both took the country in a strong grip and maddened by their pagan fury, destroyed nearly all the churches. Uh, the numbers on the screen here are the chapters of, of, the, of Gerald's work. He names the leader of this invasion as, as the super Viking Turgesius, who subjected the whole of, uh, of Ireland, fortified it with trenches and forts, uh, and ruled it for some space of time until he died deceived by a trick involving girls. At that stage, the Norwegians were either killed or driven back to their ships uh, to Norway, driven back in their ships to Norway, and the islands from which they had come. So this is, this is stereotypical Viking activity. For this section of his history, Gerald is reliant on a range of sources, including the Middle Irish text, Pugat Gaedal Regalov, so the War of the Gaels against the Vikings, Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of Britain, uh, and at least one account of Norman history. But having dispensed with the subject of Turgesius and his Norwegian invasion, Gerald then provides an account of a second Scandinavian intervention. This under the title, The Coming of the Ostmen, the Ostmanorum uh, Adventu. Not long after the expulsion of the Norwegians, Gerald claims, 
Others came again to the island from Norway and the Northern Islands. These came not in a warlike fleet, but in the guise of peace and on the pretext of commerce. Immediately they occupied the seaports and eventually with the consent of the Irish chiefs, um, they built cities. This people now called the Ottoman was at first peaceable, but later uh, began sometimes to rebel fierce, uh, fiercely. And he then tells us about the three brothers who established Dublin, Waterford and Limerick. The idea that any Scandinavian settlers who came to Ireland did so in peace and with the support of Irish kings uh, is, not, is not common, shall we say, in Irish sources. Where then did Gerald get the idea? Uh, he may have invented it, um, certainly wasn't entirely above that, but it seems to me that there's little in the topographia that's complete invention. Right? Gerald liked to um, uh, Gerald liked to take liberties with his sources, to shape his sources, to fit his own needs, but he rarely create, he was rarely creative to this extent um, concerning historical details. And I think, I think it's unlikely that this story did not have an earlier existence. I've argued in a forthcoming article that in fact this account represents a local oral tradition among the inhabitants of Dublin, uh, of Dublin concerning the city's foundation encountered by Gerald during his visit to Dublin in 1185. This, this account shares features, short as it is, it shares features with other examples of the medieval uh, origin, of the medieval genre of origin legends. Um, so for instance, the claim that the, the leaders of the Ostmen were three brothers Right? So the idea that three, of three brothers as the founding fathers of, of a community is common, it's common to a whole host of origin legends, whether that's the story of Noah, the Frankish Table of Nations, some versions of Lever Gabala, the Irish, the Irish origin legend. The name of the episode, the Adwente Osmanorum Adwentu, has echoes of the Adventus Saxonum in Britain. Um, and there's the idea that like the Saxons, um, but like the Anglo-Saxons in Britain, the Osmen are said to have come to Ireland initially in peace and later to have turned against their hosts. So this story, the coming of the Osmen, is potentially based upon an account of, of Dublin's history that was common or that was relevant in Dublin, held in Dublin at the time of Gerald's arrival there. Origin legends are, uh, are common to most peoples of medieval Europe. They are supposedly about the past, but in actual fact, tell us more about the, the people how the people concerned thought about themselves as a community when the origin legends were written. In this case, it's interesting that the Dubliners identified as merchants rather than Vikings and legitimized their place in Ireland as invited guests rather than conquerors. Now, I will come back to Gerald's story later on. Um, clearly, Hammer and Stanihurst have access to it, but it is not their source for, for the events of 1095. Gerald, if Gerald did preserve local Dublin historical tradition, that's very significant because so little survived, so little written material survived from Dublin prior to the English invasion. One of the few snippets that does, however, may help us in our quest for Hanmer's source. The so-called Annals of St. Mary's, Dublin, survive in a 15th century manuscript in Trinity College. They cover the period from Christ's birth to the 15th century, though the initial compilation happened in the 13th century. Their record for events in the 11th and 12th centuries is largely drawn from the English historian Henry of Huntington, but includes a handful of unique entries pertaining to the history of Dublin. In the opinion of Aubrey Gwynne, this small group of entries in the Annals of St. Mary's must derive from some early record of Christ Church Dublin, which is no longer extant. In other words, this material, these entries in the Annals of St. Mary's are, are potentially uh, were potentially written contemporary with events, so in the late 11th century at Christ Church. 
the link with Christchurch is apparent um, in that these entries include the obituaries of the first three bishops of Dublin, Hunan in 1074, Patricius or Gilapodic uh, in 1084, and Fungus or Donatus in 1095. Some of the information reported in these entries can be verified from other sources. Some of it is unique uh, and therefore gives us reason to believe that there is a contemporary chronicle behind them. One of these unique entries in the Annals of St. Mary's uh, records the death in 1095 of Fungus or Donatus, Bishop of Dublin. It continues, the Norwegians or Ostmen who then occupied um, the cities and coasts of, Dublin, of Ireland are called Normans in Christ. Now, setting aside for a moment the idea that the Ostmen might have rebranded themselves as Normans, let's look at the rest of this entry. The Latin verb occupare could mean to occupy in the peaceful sense of to inhabit. Uh, and it seems to me that that is how this has been understood most frequently. But it could also mean to, uh, it could also connote a forceful seizure or invasion. So that is a military occupation. And this is the sense in, sense in which it was used earlier in the Annals of St. Mary's in their account of the Norman occupation of England in 1066. So here it's clearly about an invasion. In other words, this potential, potentially contemporary Dublin source um, may record an invasion of Dublin by Ostmen in 1095. Now, either the Annals of St. Mary's themselves or the source from which they derived this information was clearly available to Stannyhurst um, when he wrote for Hollandshed's Chronicle, because he records that in the year 1095. Uh, I'm not going to read all of this because it seems to me it's just a kind of prolix and convoluted version of the same statement. But essentially, what he says is that the es Esterlings renamed themselves Normans. Um, so they, they were also, they now would also be called and accounted Normans. So it seems to me here we have pretty strong evidence that Stannyhurst had access to the Annals of St. Mary's or to the source lying behind them. Um, and if he had it for this comment, then presumably he had it also for the comment 20 pages of, uh, earlier in the book in which he reported the, the coming of the Ostmen in 1095. So Hanmer's account uh, is indebted to Stannyhurst's account, and Stannyhurst's account is indebted to this entry in the Annals of St. Mary's. The question then is, is there anything to, to corroborate the Annals of St. Mary's, that there was an invasion of some sort in 1095 or thereabouts? Uh, and I think there is. Um, and, and here I would turn to the Irish Annals uh, as a, uh, for assistance. In 1094, the Annals of Ulster and the Annals of Inishvalan both report that Murchartha Brian, um, then the most powerful king in Ireland, traveled to Dublin and expelled Gofrid Mirana from the kingship of the Gaul. Murchartach had ruled Dublin under his father's authority in the 1070s and 1080s, but had left the city to secure his succession to the kingship of Munster after his father's death in 1096, leaving, uh, leaving the way open for Gothrod to invade in 1091, as reported here in the Annals of Tigernach. The invader was Gothrod Mirana alias Godred Crovan, founding father of the dynasty that ruled Man and the Isles for the following 200 years. Um, and I'll just take a very, very brief aside on Godred because this is the, this is the King Gori or King Ori who shows up in the, the Manx National Anthem. So when Ori the Dane in Man and the Rain. Um, and the Manx National Anthem showed up a few years ago in a very strange place. And um, there was a soccer game held in the United States between Argentina and El Salvador, where for some reason the Manx anthem was played instead of the Salvadorian. Um, so, so King Ari has a link to all kinds of interesting things. Um, in any case, coming back to, to Gothard Mirana, King Ari, there's debate and uncertainty, some uncertainty regarding his background. He was almost certainly a member of the royal dynasty of Dublin, descended from Ivar, sometimes called the e Ivar, 
um, who ruled Dublin and the, the rest of the Hibernal Scandinavian world during the 10th and 11th centuries. However, his first appearance on the scene in the Irish Sea world uh, was when he was, he was found, uh, or he was found not associating with locals, uh, but with the leading power from Scandinavia itself. According to the Chronicle of the Kings of Man and the Isles, Godfred first came to Man uh, in flight from the Battle of Stamford Bridge, where he had fought alongside King Harold Hardrada of Norway against King Harold Godwinson, the last Anglo-Saxon ruler of England. A decade or so later, uh, Godfred um, conquered the Isle of Man, and it was from there that he launched his invasion of Dublin in 1091. I would suggest uh, tentatively that Godfred may have achieved these successes, so his conquest of Man and later his conquest of Dublin, with the assistance of others, uh, others of those who had fled from the carnage of Stamford Bridge. Perhaps uh, Godfred offered them opportunities for plunder and conquest. Uh, perhaps he offered these opportunities to the remnants of Harold's, Harold Hardrada's Norwegian army. Might these Norwegians be the Norwegians or Ostmen that the Annals of St. Mary's record as having, uh, as having uh, invaded or attacked the city and coasts of Ireland in the 1090s? I think this is possible. I think one reason that people have not potentially thought about that previously um, is because of the reference here to Ostmen and the fact that the word Ostmen is generally thought to refer to all of the Hiberno Scandinavian residents of Dublin and Ireland's coastal towns during this period. The reason that, that people believe that is because that's what Gerald tells us. He tells us that the the, the inhabitants of Dublin, Dublin called themselves, uh, themselves Ostmen in their own language. It is the case, though, that all but one example of the use of the term Ostmen, and that the one exception is the entry in the Annals of St. Mary's under discussion, so all other examples of the use of the term appear in documents written by the English invaders. This led Emer Purcell to suggest that the term may actually have been introduced by the English. Um, now, I've previously argued against that and, and wasn't at all convinced, but more recently, uh, I'm, I'm starting to come round to the idea. I'm not sure that introduced is necessarily the correct term, but there may be something to the idea that the term Ostmen originally had a much narrower currency prior to the English invasion. Gerald's Latin term, Ostmani, is based on the Old Norse Ostmen, meaning Eastmen, which is used relatively frequently in the Icelandic sagas. Now, I, I'm no expert in the sagas, but thankfully people who are uh, have examined the use of this term in them, including uh, Caitlin Ellis, who will be addressing you tomorrow. In the sagas, the term Ostmen is used primarily to refer to Norwegians. But recent uh, research by Caitlin Ellis and others has shown that it, it had more subtle connotations. As Chris Callow has said, we've every reason to respect that the term Osman is synonymous with terms for trader. Or in Anne-Marie Long's uh, opinion, uh, the term is associated with fighters or bowmen. So the identification of an Ausmother with, uh, as a skilled combatant suggests the association of particular, a particular ethnicity with a specific uh, profession. Uh, as Caitlin Ellis says, the perception of who constituted an Osman was likely situational, um, by which she means it is somebody from east of wherever you are. Um, in other words, there's no suggestion in the sagas that the term was in any way specific to the Scandinavian inhabitants of Ireland and every impression that it was used to refer to those from Norway or other parts of Scandinavia east of the author's Icelandic home, but particularly those associated with itinerant uh, uh, careers, itinerant jobs such as merchants and mercenaries. 
Itinerant soldiers are precisely the kinds of people Alfred Mirana would have been able to recruit to his cause in the aftermath of the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Are these the Ostmen or Norwegians um, whose attacks on Dublin were recorded by the Christchurch Chronicler, whose work survives today in the Annals of St. Mary's? The fact that they were also called Normans may be why the Annals of Tigernach referred to Gothard Meronach as King of the Normans, a rare title in Irish sources during this period. Now, if Gothard's, if Gothard's Norwegian followers settled in Dublin and remained there after his expulsion in 1094, their number may have been augmented and increased a few years later during Magnus Bearleg's sojourn in the region. These late 11th century arrivals, in other words, may have been the original true Ostmen of Dublin. Gerald links the term with both Norwegians and merchants. So there's some, clearly some overlap with, between his usage and that in the sagas. But perhaps he was mistaken in applying the term to the entire population of Dublin. It has been used generally by the English invaders of Ireland in place of a narrower term referring only to a specific community of relatively late settlers. All this is to say, and this is my closing point, that Meredith Hanmer's record of a distinct wave of invasion and settlement in Dublin, uh, in the Dublin region in about 1095 by a group of Ostmen might well be based on historical events. Those events were the arrival in Dublin of a contingent of Norwegians, the kinds of people Scandinavian settlers in the West referred to as Ostmen in the entourage of Gothard Meirana, uh, King of Man in the Isles when he invaded in 1098. With that, I will finish. Good meal, Margaret.